So you're in Vermont. You're in Vermont, Howard. Tell us for people watching yep. in the UK who've never been to Vermont. Is it you know? Okay, tell so us about it. Is it Vermont, it well, it's, Vermont is uh, one of our senators is Bernie Sanders. Yeah. So that may give you a sense of what Vermont is like. It's a it's a small state. So um, you know, population wise, it's not that tiny, but um. We are in the Northeast. Uh, I, I live about an hour south of the Canadian border and about two hours to Montreal. Um, I live in a ski town called Stowe, with an E, S-T-O-W-E. And it's a wonderful community. I've had a house here since 87, so it's been quite a while. But uh, when, we, when I retired in 2012, I sold my house and I said to my wife, you want to live in Stowe? And she said, yep. And here we are. <laughs> so it's so great. It's what have you been doing for the six years since you retired? Well, I, I actually, because a lot of my practice was manipulation based, um, and I have, um, you know, I have the Vasily Dannenberg orthotics, I kind of can practice the way I always liked. So I do see friends. I have a large group of contingent from the ski school who hurt themselves in a large variety of different ways. And, um, and so I keep my hand in it and a bunch of friends and <clears throat> that sort of thing. I don't advertise it or make a big deal about it because I really don't want to work that much. But um, <laughs> I, I've, uh, I've written, I still do, I don't know, three or four talks a year, depending on where, where and when I just, I was with Craig in Naples for the Italian meeting, which was a lot of fun. Um, I also have a business interest in a company called Visolia that many in the UK may be aware of. It's, yeah. um, we, we, sell shoes to, we sell products to Marks and Spencer that makes their shoes more comfortable. And that takes a fair amount of time as we develop new products for a variety of different things. And we have, com we have um, uh, customers all over the world, uh, shoe companies. We, we don't, we, there's some retail for this, but um, mostly, although actually that's changing in the UK. Um, you can buy, there's an aftermarket product for high heels that, and what it does is it's not a pad in the least. It's actually pretty firm gel. And what it does is it shifts weight so that you can take the heel and tip it backwards so that you can, and very subtle, um, <clears throat> tip the heel back. So you shift about 30% of the weight off the forefoot onto the back of the heel. So it's more like a flat, like 50, 50 balance. And women can wear them about four times longer than they normally can with no stress the next day. So it's a great product. I love it. Uh, Marks and Spencer's business took off like a shot. They sell six or seven million pair of these a year. So it's good business. Wow. Yeah. You don't sound, that, does, that doesn't sound like retirement to me at all. You sound like you're... Yeah, well, I, <laughs> you know, what I did was I shifted the main amount of my time to exercise. And so I do, I, we have a big dog and we hike pretty much every day. I mean, I don't go crazy, but you know, an hour or so, maybe a little more plus minus. And then I come home and I work out. And then by that time I've already read the paper and, you know, online and do what I do. And then it's lunchtime and then we do stuff and I write or I read or I, you know, do stuff with my wife. And it's kind of been a great life. Stowe is a very interesting retirement community in that we have a lot of friends who are our age and older who activity levels are so high that the motivation level is high um, to just be with them and to be able to do stuff. So go skiing in the morning and hiking in the snow with cleats on in the afternoon. So it's, 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 it's a very physically fit lifestyle and it's a lot of fun. It's good. It's great. Now I have a, I have my 40th birthday coming up in a week's time. And if I, if my calculation is correct, you <coughs> You've been a practicing podiatrist for 40 years this year. Is that right? Well, uh, well I, I, I've been a practicing podiatrist. No, that was when I retired six years ago. Oh, you're so. so, oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, so, yeah, so I'm I way mean, past you. Yeah. No, I'm going to actually, my next birthday, I'll be 70. So, um, and, wow. and I, I, you know, I, there, are, there was an interesting thing that I read, I don't know, about a, two weeks ago, about what is it about longevity? I mean, I think good genes help. But the, the interesting factor be, and more important than exercise and more important than not smoking was the, having a strong relationship with a spouse and having a very strong community relationship. That the spouse and the community relationship were the two leading factors in understanding longevity. Isn't that incredible? I saw that. That was a TED talk, wasn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. It was yeah, great. yeah, I saw that. Yeah, I saw yeah, that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was great. I mean, I mean and it really – and that's where I live. I live in a place just like that. One of our friends – fell skiing and broke both legs and her arm. <laughs> it wasn't a good injury. But she, and she had a house in Boston. They stayed here just because of the community. And there have been people, we just always go there and visit. And there's always a, there's actually someone created a, uh, 
website so that you'd know when somebody else was visiting so you wouldn't have to go. You know, there was a chart. And a <laughs> so and we kept her busy the whole time. It was great. So that's where I live. So, a great community. That's awesome. Um, Craig, we'll, we'll get cracking with the we'll questions. Started, yeah, start with the questions. We've got yeah. 24 people online and, and obviously we've had a chat. Howard's, well, yep. anyone, I, I refuse to believe anyone watching this does, hasn't heard of Howard Dannenberg. I mean, just like me, you know, practicing, we, we grew up, we were trained reading your papers amongst others. So uh, thank you so much for joining us. You know, real, real honor to be able to speak, real honor to be able to speak to you. We're going to get kicked off with, with the most popular question. I was emailed this one, I believe Craig was emailed it as well. And that is um, the question that anyone of, who's come up with a, a fairly renowned and well-known theory will get asked. And that is, can you tell us how it came about? You know, was it, you know, is there a great story behind this? The sagittal plane theory, were you just sitting on the toilet one day and, and there it was? Or you know, how did it all begin? Well, it wasn't that. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, that wasn't how it happened. It was a, um, I had been, I had already been playing around with treating Halix limitus with orthotics and varieties of shapes of first rate cutouts. I didn't know anything about really what I was doing, quite frankly. But it sort of made sense that, that you needed to make the first metatarsal plantar flex some. And so by cutting out uh, the medial side of the orthotic seemed to make sense. And I was getting some success. But I had also, had, it was 1982 when this kind of, 82, 83 when this really started. And I was one of the first podiatrists to get an electrodynogram, the EDG from Langer. And I, I, I remember spending a Saturday one day having a, a patient who I really liked, good guy, came in, and I had him walk with his orthotics and without his orthotics and, and, and try to figure out the difference. And I kind of really drove myself crazy. I, I, I just didn't know what I was looking at. I didn't understand it. It didn't make any sense. And then a lady came in to see me, and she was probably in her late 50s. And for the majority of her life, she had chronic anterior tibial pain on the left lower leg every night. It bothered her every night when she was at rest, not during the day, but at night when she rested. And it just drove her crazy. And I was like the 13th or 14th person that she saw, and no one knew what it was. So I said, well, I could do this test for you. She'd heard about that from somebody, and <clears throat> I said, I'd be happy to do it. And so I did. And, and the electrodynogram in those days produced a, a, a um, sort of like, like a, a receipt that you get you know, in a store, a long printout. And it had left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot. And you know, you use, there were two heel sensors, a fifth metatarsal, second metatarsal, first metatarsal, hallux sensor, sub IP joint, and an X sensor that you could put anywhere. Well, I looked at the test and I had examined her and it was nothing unusual about her feet in the least. And I looked at the test and on one step, there was four times her body weight under her hallux. And on the next left foot step, there was no weight on the hallux. And the, all the weight was carried on the fifth metatarsal the entire time. And then in the six or seven step sequences, that's what I saw. That, that a lot of hallux load and then no hallux load. Then a lot of hallux load and then no hallux load. And I was like, I, 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 wait a minute, I didn't see that. And then I watched her walk again. And I could see that she inverted her foot every other step. And you could see the anterior tibial muscle firing, you know, in the middle of the step, and it's a swing phase muscle, as most everybody listening to this probably knows. And so it was, whoa, that's what's causing this. But why? She had no hallux limitus. And I knew about the lock maneuver that you invert your foot when you hurt your toe. Anybody who's ever stubbed their big toe knows that. You just walk away from it. And I, I began to think about that. And I looked at her and I decided that I would treat her the way I was treating these hallux limitus patients. So I started to taper foot up, and I, I'd, I had already by that time modified Lodi that I took the medial retention strap, and instead of putting it medially, I would ring it plantar, I dorsiflex the hallux and put it underneath the first metatarsal head to hold it in a down position. And I watched her walk afterwards and repeated the EDG because I left the sensors on, and sure enough, the problem went away. And I went, and then I was playing with her foot and accidentally, I literally accidentally, I loaded the, the metatarsal head, loaded the hallux, and I couldn't bend it. It was as stiff as a board. And I let go, and it was flexible. And I said, wow, she's got like hallux limitus, but there's no hallux limitus. What is this? And I can still remember I'm on my ride home thinking, wow, she's compensating for something that doesn't hurt her. I wonder how common that is. Well, the next day I went in and every pronating patient seemed to have this. And I said, uh-oh, 
what is this? This is more than I could imagine. And that's kind of how it started. Um, and there was more to it than that. I mean, pretty quickly on, I decided to write a paper more to get my, uh, my thoughts down on a page more, and to understand what I was looking at more than anything else. I, uh, I wrote it and I sent it to Shelley Langer at, at Langer Biomechanics at the time. And because I had gotten close to him because I was so early on with the EDG. And he sent it back filled with red notes about my grammar and my spelling and all the other things. There was no computer. I typed it. Um, but he said, he said, this is revolutionary. And from him, that was a big deal. So that's pretty much how it started. And then it became filling in the pieces and understanding what happened and looking at outcomes and understanding how to change orthotics. I guess there's one more interesting part to the story. There was a lawyer that I knew, a good guy, um, who had been, he was a runner and he looked like uh, he would, he would tape both, he would wrap both his knees and he would cover it in DMSO. And, you know, this was in the 80, early 80s. And I called him up and I had made him a pair of orthotics like, like, like Schuster had and Steve Sabotnik had. He had traveled over the country to get orthotics made and nobody helped him. And I called him up. I said, Alan, I think I know what you have. Why don't you come back and I'll adjust your orthotic when you can. It was like I hung up the phone and he was there. I mean, he just showed up so fast. I adjusted orthotic and I really didn't see him again, except around town periodically, um, except for every five years to replace his orthotic. And that was it. I cured him. And so I began to realize this is a pretty interesting concept and different than how everybody else understood what pronation was and the whole process. So that's my story. Yeah, God, the, the EDG brings back some memories, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Well, it was an interesting system. I mean, it yeah. probably wasn't, the four times body weight probably wasn't very accurate. Yeah, but no. what it was accurate with was, but it, but it showed the timing. And it showed that there was a lot more lateral load than there was medial load or there was more medial load than lateral load. And when she inverted her foot to walk on the fifth metatarsal, the other thing that happened is that heel contact duration shortened. Hmm. So when she would jam into her hallux and it wouldn't bend, heel contact time was rather long. When she inverted her foot, avoided it, and the toe would bend, then heel contact time shortened. And, and I, I remember staring at that and thinking about that and saying, boy, that's pretty intriguing. I bet that means something. <laughs> yeah, and we know, we know yeah. what it means now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm not so, sure, I mean, but... <laughs> that, that, that feeling you get when you first think I've really stumbled onto something here that no one to date has stumbled onto. Uh, I need you know, describe to us, you know, you got all these things racing through your mind. Describe to us how that felt and how you thought to yourself, right? Cause the first paper you wrote, which was the first paper you wrote about this? Was it the well, I, I wrote a, I wrote a paper in, um, I think 84 was an article that a functional hallux limitus and its effect on normal ambulation it was the first paper I wrote it was published in Japan in 84. And I won the Astro award for that. And I gave a talk at Hershey at the Hershey. I don't think the Hershey meeting even goes on anymore, but it was a huge podiatry meeting with over a thousand participants. And I, and I, because I won one of those awards, I got asked to give an oral presentation at the meeting and Harold Schoenhaus was the one who was going to critique it. And I, I mean, I think, the whole day I ate an apple. And if anybody knows me knows that I, how much I eat that that's an, I mean, I was just so nervous and because I had never, I mean, I was exposed to everybody. It's like sort of take an idea that, that is unique and individual to you and to present that to a whole lot of people. is like standing naked in grand central station. You know, it's like, you're, you're just exposed and it's a very, very interesting sensation. And I got done doing my talk, which I had worked, hours and countless hours on presenting and Schoenhaus got up and he said well everybody knows that what Root said but this is really intriguing I didn't when I read your paper I didn't get it like this until I heard it hmm, I have to think about this and I said oh maybe this, really maybe there's something to this so and that, that, that initial that, feedback was it was it overwhelmingly positive were there any yes because I you know, there was no real pushback. There was no. Well, I think there was a lot of people. No, there was a lot of folks. Still are. You know. No, it's riff foot pronation first. I got all, probably um, maybe three or four years into it. You know, I I I did a talk for a friend of mine who was a physiatrist in San Francisco, and so I decided to go around and I met John Weed and went to his office and hung out with him for a little while. <laughs> And then he suggested, he said, you got to meet Mert because he'd love you and you got to talk to him about this. So I drove up to, to, um, 
just north of Sacramento, I, I, uh, Auburn, I think, mm -hmm. California. And I drove up yeah. and I spent an afternoon with him. It was the highest level biomechanics talk I ever had with anybody. And we talked almost four hours straight. And I remember I was about two hours, or two and a half hours to drive back to San Francisco. And I remember being so mentally exhausted <laughs> going back. And, and his comment was, he said, I love what you're doing. He said, I still think pronation comes first, but, 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 but you've intrigued me. So I knew that I was onto something by that time. Yeah. Actually, it's interesting how to reflect back on and what you said. If you were to come up with something like that today, it's a very different environment. You'd have to yeah. do all the lab experiments, everything first, but to be taken seriously. Um, things that you know, the, the world we yeah, I, I, it would admit, but it was you know I mean I, I think it's not fair to yeah. judge by current standards. I, I, you oh, know, I, I, mean, I agree totally. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I mean I, was, I mean I was in an office in Manchester, New Hampshire, a city of one hundred thousand people. I was kind of isolated in a lot of ways and away from mainstream podiatry. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I think that was an advantage in that, though, to be away from it and to to have um, to have the isolation. And, and, and the, <clears throat> I spend, uh, I mean, I'm not that much of an outdoor, I mean, I love the outdoors and I'm outside every day, but to have places to go hike in, in the woods and have the isolation of that was very helpful. I mean, it really let me clear my head and understand what it was and not living, I grew up in New York City, so that was one environment and this was the 180 degrees in the other direction and it really was very helpful. Sure, yeah. Did, did, did you ever, I mean, what, what, it, what, what it, it essentially became was uh, one of the, you know, when people talk about paradigms of foot function, and we're talking across the world, at any level, undergraduate, postgraduate, this theory is right. now discussed and mentioned. Did you ever envisage when you were, that, that that would be the case, that it would be so widespread uh, sort of acceptance with regard to mainstream education? That's a good question. I, uh, I, I, I think I knew it was important, <clears throat> and... I, you know, and, and Root's reaction was, was very helpful. I, don't, I, I didn't really think about it in terms of, boy, every student in the world's going to, your podiatry student in the world's going to understand this. And a lot of physical therapists, too, um, are going to understand this and want to understand it more. I, I, I don't think that really occurred to me early on. Um, I did meet George Goodhart at one time, um, who was one of the world's most famous chiropractors. Incredible guy, incredible guy. He lived in, in, near Detroit in Gross Point, Michigan. And he, he, co he contacted me and, and asked to speak, and, and we chatted for quite a while, and then I went to visit him, and, and he said, do you understand what this means? Do you understand what this is? And I said, I think so. He said, no, you don't. You, have, you, you haven't gotten there yet. You need more time. And th that was probably in the early 90s. So I, I think he was right. I mean, this is evolved. It continues to evolve in my mind to understand what it means and what it's about and the implications of it. Um, it, 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 it has been a fascinating ride quite frankly and especially the part about back pain i mean i think that's one of the things i'm most proud of is two things actually understanding the relationship of gait to back pain and how it's not impact shock but the the ability to extend your limbs when you walk the the hip has to extend in order to preload it for swing phase for pre-swing and it's the weight of the limb when pre-swing is inadequate that it can't it's very hard to initiate swing phase then. And since the muscles that initiate it come from the back, it's not the structure of the back that causes the pain, it's the stress to the back that causes the pain. And very often it's coming from feet. I published a paper, I, I really don't remember the date, it was uh, probably in, um, maybe in 2001 actually, because I remember the flying was a little, it, all of a sudden it suddenly become very difficult. And, uh, <clears throat> and it was in Montreal, and <clears throat> I gave a talk at the World Congress of Back Pain there. And um, there was a lot of interest in this at that time. And, and, and the paper had been reviewed and discussed. And I think then I began to sort of see the implications of this and what it would mean. So I, it was a really proud thing. The second thing I was very proud of is recognizing the relationship of curve shape in pressure analysis to motion. I think that was really, that to me, that was the the big breakthrough in understanding what this was about, that you have, you have curves that are shaped like double humps, you know, the, the classic double hump curve in a, in a gait test, and then you have a curve that's flat. I mean, those are basically the two with variations on that theme. Watch the difference, because the double hump curve is normal, but the flat, the plateau curve, is the one that's consistent with osteoarthritis and many other 
uh, many other issues. <clears throat> and it was, it was reading through chapter two in Root's Abnormal and Normal Motion, where he showed the force parallelograms and how when a metatarsal is basically parallel to the ground, you can't transmit force from the distal end. But when the metatarsal moves up to vertical, you transmit maximum force. And it has to do with forces through the foot and its alignment. And so I realized that when you have a flat line on a force to time graph, you have constant force. Constant force is no motion. And that's, that was the big breakthrough in understanding what, what I was looking at in, in, after EDG became FSTAN. And, and then, I mean, the, the, the quality of the, of the scanning and the information was dramatically improved. And, and then I really began to understand what was happening and, and be able to devise all kinds of orthotic modifications and that sort of thing. I think one of the most interesting things about all that <clears throat> was how subtle orthotic changes needed to be to bring about a, um, a, a change. <clears throat> that, that by the time, <clears throat> it's allergy season here, so excuse me, where <laughs> there's tons of pollen in the air. Um, that, that when, if you take an orthotic and you put a four, five, six degree post on it and something else in the forefoot and you lock, you know, you can try to limit motion. Um, by the time you see a change in the knee or the back or the hip, you've overdone it by a lot in order to see those things. You need far less to get a really major outcome change. And I think that was one of the things that made a big difference. When I would have people visit me, I, and I, you know, I, I had a string of, of, of podiatrists come and visit over the years, the, the most common pr constant comment that I got was, that's all you do? <laughs> was because I kept it limited. I mean, the more I learned, the less orthotic prescription I used, the less posting, the less rear foot, the less hard the shell. It just became, how do you mobilize the MTP joint? And then when you do that, look at all the things that happen. And I think that became the big change, the thing that, that really s sort of skyrocketed me to understand, wow, this is n nothing wrong with the 87 paper. That was, <laughs> it was, I, I had it right then and I still do. With a lot of the uh, foot theories of foot function paradigms, if you like, um, mm -hmm. although a bit crude to do so, you can pretty much sum them up with, you know, whether you take tissue stress theory or root theory, you could sum them up in a couple of sentences crudely. Yeah. If, if, if a student asks you to sum up your sagittal plane theory in, in, you know, in a very sort of brief couple of sentences, how would you do that? Um, you have to walk forward. I mean, walk, the, the primary thing we do is walk forward. And so we are taking the center of body and passing it over the standing foot. To do that, you need to step over the foot. Think about what happens if you can't. What are the avenues that you can take if that motion plane were unavailable? That's how I would sum it up. Because that's what you see when you watch people walk. It's pretty simple. That, that I mean, to my way of thinking at this stage of the game, it's when you see abduction, you see adduction. I mean, sure, there are anatomical bases for that. Of course there are. But, but then people pick the path of least resistance to forward, pro, um, forward progression. I'm, I'm a very strong believer, as Craig knows, um, that, that humans walk by pulling, that the swing limb is paramount in, in, in watching people move, and that you step forward when you walk. And or backward or left or right. It's you always use this the non weight bearing limb, which pushes air out of the way, which makes it easy to move the center of mass, which then uses the weight of the limb to drive the body, the ground in any direction you want. Generally it's straight ahead. So when you understand how that that the power source is not in the muscles of the leg, but in the action of the swing limb and you realize that's being transmitted to the foot, and then the foot needs to just let you pass over it. If you can't, then that force that's pulling you forward needs to be dissipated somehow. And that's what we see when we watch all kinds of you know, um, abnormal gates. One, one, of the, one of the most profound things that I saw over the years of working, this is sort of an interesting story too. I, I, um, it's nice to have all this time to 
digress about these things. Mm-hmm. I worked for a group called Crotchet Mountain Rehab Center in New Hampshire. Um, and it was, a, it was a center that treated um, children with a wide variety of handicaps, mostly um, cerebral palsy, um, amongst other things. And, and <clears throat> they were quite an advanced place at the time. And, and they, um, they asked me to work with them. So I did, and I had some good success in the beginning. And then they sent me a young woman. She was just about to leave because she was 20 at the time. And, and I, I watched her. She had cerebral palsy, had the classic scissor gait, and she, she used Canadian crutches to walk. And I, I looked at that, and I realized how much functional hallux limitus was playing a role in her gait. And so I, I created a temporary orthotic for her. We put it in her shoes, and she walked afterwards. And we had to raise her Canadian crutches six inches because she stood up so upright. It was such a dramatic change. I mean, I, I was floored by that. My office assistant, who's worked for me for 25 years, broke into tears. It was an incredible experience, just incredible. And so I, I was so excited about what this meant that I called them to Crotchet Mountain. I spoke to the head of PT. And the next thing that happened was they threw me out of the program <laughs> because they said, no, 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 that's not from what you did. That's the, I, I I, I went, well, well, I mean, I know you guys did a lot, but, but well, I, I, this is amazing. We could all share this. What, what's the problem? <laughs> but they, they didn't like that. And um, they, they were really angry about it, quite frankly. And it was, uh, it was a real rude awakening about um, turf battles and how they play out. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. One last, one last question about the early stuff, the 1986 paper, which is probably one one of the the most well-read here in the UK at undergrad level, your functional hallux limitus uh, relationship to gait efficiency, I I think that's what it's called. Um, Craig's been asked before about papers he wrote 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. If he rereads them today through his current lens, does he still agree with himself? Would he write it any differently today? I don't know when you last read that that paper of yours, which is now what's that, thir- thirty-two years old. Um, <laughs> don't but, remind but me. Do, do, do you uh, do you still fully agree? Would you write it identically today? I um, yeah, I think pretty much. Um, I, I think that there's nothing in it that's wrong. What I would do is add to it. I think that the idea of tissue stress makes a lot of sense, but I think there's more to it than just orthotic. Um, what I've learned over the years, I mean, some of it was through the association with George Goodhart because he did a lot of muscle testing and muscle function work, um, was the effect of muscle inhibition on gait style and how that um, contributes to a lot of symptoms that we see over a long-term basis. So I think I would have added that stuff to it. I mean, I've since published a lot of that, but um, so I probably have, would have added that. But other than that, I think it's pretty accurate, and, um, and, and I think it's one of the better papers I ever wrote. Mm. Um, Craig, did you want to share? You had an image from it. Yeah, well, I, I, I've got a. Now's a good time. Yeah, this yep. is a, Now's let, a good let me just share my screen, everybody. This is. Oh, where is it? This is this is this is a question I actually had for Howard. I just. Let me just go full screen. Now, some of you may have actually seen this paper. Um, I know Howard hasn't because we talked about it beforehand. But it, it's this, James Amos talks about the split second effect about how Aquinas can affect uh, foot function. And if you look at the left picture there, you obviously mid stance. And what he's claiming in the second picture here is that in that 120 milliseconds, the equinus of the tight calf muscle causes this uh, midfoot break, which he actually calls the fourth rocker, which is an interesting idea. Now, as soon as I read this paper, and as soon as I looked at that picture, that picture looked very, very familiar. And this is a screenshot from one of Howard's videos almost the exact same picture. And obviously in Howard's video, this was a functional hallux limitus. It wasn't a tight calf muscle. So my, my question for Howard or, or the point for discussion is here are two images of pretty much exactly the same thing with two people attributing a different reason for it. And I, I always find that kind of um, discussion quite intriguing. So I was just wondering how, what, you, what your comment would be on, you know, here's the same thing, but two different versions of it. Well, for, I, I think I told you when we started, we, we would be warming up before the, uh, we started this, um, that one of the, um, one of the aspects of, of making orthotics for kids with Aquinas was that you can't make a rigid orthotic because they'll crack them in half. 
And it always bothered me about why they just didn't bounce off of it. There was something missing. I mean, and, and I was always taught, well, you're compensating the metarsal joint. And it's compensating for what? For the equinus. But why don't they just bounce off? Until I learned about functional hollux limitus. Now, literally, you're caught between a rock and a hard place. That you have the heel coming up soon, but the MTP joint's not moving. So you got to move back one joint, and that's why that happens. Mm -hmm. That it's got to be, the, the middle is breaking because the MTP joint motion is lost. That's why that happens. And, and that, those two pictures, and mine was done in 1986 mm. or maybe 89, something like that. It was quite a while ago. Yeah. So that's been around for a while. And, um, uh, and, and that editing wasn't done on a computer. Any, I mean, it was in a big room and we sat there for 16 hours and it was really hard. So, um, you know, I remember that all too well. Um, but uh, the, the concept of, of lack of motion at one site and then compensation for that in another um, sits really well with how I view things and understand them over time. So that's why I didn't change anything from 87. Yeah, and I just find it intriguing how two people can look at the same thing and have a very different explanation for it. And it's, it's, it, happens, well, it, it happens a lot. Yeah. I, I'm sure it does. I, I think he needs to look at, to understand functional hollux limitus, and then he'll realize where that comes from. Actually, um, Bruce Williams just made a comment. Uh, yeah, if, if you could only add a heel lift for the ankle joint equinus, the midfoot collapse will still occur. So that, that's a good, good point on that. Yeah. Yeah, good for him. Hi, Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> um, on that note, talking about uh, papers that have been published since yours that, that, that don't contradict yours, but they just make us view it a few different lights and, and open discussion. Um, we had a question come in beforehand, which was a question for you, Howard, on, on how, how you view your theory with the current evidence of the bone pin studies. So Chris Nestor wrote uh, a, a review in, in 2009 in, in JFAR, just a review of what the bone pin studies told us. And one of the most sort of striking things that jumped out at it was, was that we were probably not to simply view the ankle as a, as a purely sort of a sagittal plane joint, which again, we've, we've done historically. Um, what, are your, what are your takes on that? And does that, you know, in this kind of progression through the sagittal plane and the concept that the ankle now has frontal plane motion at it, uh, what, what are your thoughts on how that feeds into well, sort of, you know, I'm your theory? I think it makes perfect sense that, <clears throat> that when you see, because what I've said for many years now is that, that pronation is more retrograde, that you have, that you have pronation and contact, which is a, a energy storage impact uh, attenuating motion that lasts for a very brief amount of time. In fact, when you look at F-Scan or EDG or any of the pressure analysis systems, I'm sure they're all pretty similar in, in, in this context, that the period of time from heel strike to peak heel load is very, very difficult, if not impossible, to alter. You just don't see that change no matter what you do. What changes is peak heel load to heel off and then the effect on the forefoot. That's what you see. So understanding that once you start to lift it, because there's a period of time from that peak heel load until heel off where the calcaneus is bearing less and less and less load. It's dropping down until visible heel lift occurs. Well, there's got to be some fulcrum point about which that's happening. And I think that happens in the midfoot, like we saw in the pictures that Craig just showed. Um, but it should happen at the MTP joint. It should happen almost immediately. As soon as the heel begins to, as soon as heel off occurs, the, the metatarsals should move, should pivot the bases about the heads. That's how they should move. And when they don't move, while the body is stepping forward and the power that drives you is being exerted from the top down, you now have to dissipate that force if you're not going forward. There's got to be a place for it to go. You can't store energy. Um, you can store it briefly, but you can't modify it. And, so, and, and so during that storage period, 
is when you start to see the dissipation. And I think that's really where that comes from. The fact that the, an that the ankle moves in triplanes, they all move in triplanes, even the toe joints do. I mean, it just makes no sense that they don't. I mean, we have devised the planes so that we understand it. It doesn't mean that that's how it works. It's just trying to make it so that we can fit it into some paradigm that we can understand with our viewpoints, our simplistic viewpoints, if I might add. Um, and, and that it doesn't mean that it's right or wrong. I hear my dog trying to come in. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's right or wrong. It means that, um, that, that w probably the views we have are somewhat limited and, and that the more you expand on understanding, you know, I, like I, my, one of my favorite quotes was from Einstein that said, I don't care what anybody thinks about it. I only care what God thinks about it. Um, and I'm not a very religious person, but, but that concept of that makes a lot of sense. So, um, I, and I think that's the same way, that it's not surprising that the ankle has more than one plane of motion. I mean, I never really thought it didn't. So, and I, I just think that the motion that you see, it's all about timing. That's the key, and that's what we never, that's what pressure analysis gave us, was the way to accurately and specifically measure the timing of the events that they, as they occurred. And so a lot, I mean, we know that pronation that's pathologic is late mid-stance. Well, the heel's coming up. What's supposed to happen then? I mean, it, you know, the idea of, um, I mean, I, I, Kevin Kirby and I have been friends for many, many years, and I respect and really like him. We disagree, though, on, 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 on what, um, on, on where this all comes from and what it's about. And, and, and my disagreement is that, that from the time that peak heel load is reached, until heel off occurs, there is content, continuously decreasing loads on the heel. Those loads are coming off, not on. So the idea of, of subtilar joint axis and the whole principle there needs to be updated in context of, of the timing of the events that are occurring. When they're occurring, where the weight should be, what should be moving at those times. And we pretty much know that you can't take a static shaped foot and extrapolate what's going to happen to it when they walk. It just doesn't make sense because it's about mobility. It's not about static things. And it's not about, and in fact, even for treatment, it really should be about motion enhancement, not motion control. Yeah, but I know how, yeah, sorry, how, I know well, I went through quite a stage where I spent quite a bit of time looking at the, the slope of that curve of the load coming off the heel. Yeah. We often talk about heel off, but it's not really heel off. It's heel unweighting. It's this, I wrote about that long, many years ago, right? Yeah, and that curve can be quite steep in some people and, quite, quite, and, and that makes a huge difference. Huge difference. In fact, it may not even be, it, it, it may not be continuous. I mean, that comes back to the flat line again, where it comes off and then it levels and it comes off and it levels. And sometimes you can actually see the forefoot accommodations occurring that are allowing it to start to lift again. You can watch that process happen. It's fascinating. Your, your comment about timing is brilliant because fairly early on in my career, you know, having been taught to think in 3D, my, one of very good influence on me, who's, a, who's our guest next week, Simon Spooner, he pretty much said to me, you need to stop thinking in 3D, you need to start thinking in 4D, the fourth dimension being time. Uh, and it just it was it was a real turning point for the way I viewed human for that, that particular comment. It's interesting to see you on that page. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well. I've been that way for a long time. It's really all yeah. about timing. And that, that, I mean, I don't understand how the influence on the subtalar joint could be, as, as is said, because the timing doesn't make sense. That, that, that you have to have increasing loads on the heel for that to exert the force as described versus decreasing loads, which can't do that. So. Um. I don't know if any questions have come in on Facebook, Craig. No, nothing. Uh, Bruce has been making a lot of good comments, but no questions. But Bruce did comment that did jar my memory on one thing, and the and the question I might might ask is the this perineal inhibition stuff we you often talk about, yeah. and I I know I've seen it where you know, you do the 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 strength testing and the perineals appear to be weak. You mobilise the fibula and you do it again, and there's a massive increase in the strength or what appears to be a massive increase in yep. the strength. Now, I'm well aware of party tricks. I'm well aware of um, seeing what you want to see. But mm -hmm. I, you know, the science side of me says that this, like I'm trying to come up with a plausible explanation for this perineal inhibition, perhaps related to fibula mobility. I just wonder if you could try and have a go yeah. at explaining it. <laughs> I'm not yep. denying it doesn't happen, but I'm just 
no, no, you want an explanation for it. I, yeah. I, it's, it certainly has intrigued me, to, but I also know that I don't quite get it. I'll, let me give you what I, how I think about it, though, which may be helpful. So inhibition and facilitation, so weak and strong, um, are essential in body mechanics of anything. So that when you learn to play the piano, when you move your fingers up and down, when you bring your finger down or type on a keyboard or anything like that, when you bring your finger down, it's known that the flexor tendon is, is facilitated or excited or strengthened, and its opposite tendon is inhibited. That's normal because that gives you some sense of control without totally inhibiting the motion itself. And the other way, the way I explain it during lectures is that if I had a barbell in my hand and I was doing a curl, the reason I don't knock out my teeth with the weight when I bring the weight up is because the tricep is controlling the motion. But if the tricep was fully on, then I would never be able to move the weight because I'd be quivering in between the bicep and the tricep. So the body uses a balance, and it takes a long time to learn that. That's why it takes time to type. That's why it takes quite a while to learn how to type. It takes eons to learn how to play a musical instrument and be good at it because you have to synchronize those motions. Well, if inhibition and excitation happen normally, then I think it stands to reason that you can have chronic inhibition or chronic excitation. Chronic excitation is what you see in cerebral palsy, that you have, you have nerves that are blocked and essentially um, uh, that there's no, the inhibition to certain groups of muscles is lost. And so now you have these muscles that are spastic because they don't get the inhi inhibitory signal. Well, if you take that information and then you say, well, suppose an I chronically inhibit a perineal muscle, for instance, as we're talking about that, through a minor ankle sprain, which I've seen millions of times, and um, well, millions is probably an exaggeration, but thousands wouldn't be. Um, and, and, and then the net effect of that, I mean, think of what happens, that people, um, you, ha you have a gamut of, of symptoms in, from ankle sprain. They could run from, you know, you get a little bit of swelling and a little bit of soreness and it goes away in a couple of weeks, to you can get like reflex sympathetic dystrophy or chronic regional pain syndrome. I mean, that, that's, that's a, a spectrum of how the symptoms will play out in individuals. Now, I, I've had the experience of manipulating patients who have had um, regional, chronic regional pain syndrome and have it spontaneously resolved. So there's a lot to this, and, I, and, and it's phenomenal to see. I have one terrific story about this. Um, I, I took care of a guy many, many years ago, um, and very early on in my histories of manipulation of practice, and he had been delivering a crate of bananas um, in Boston in the middle of winter. Um, and he slipped on the, on the ice on the loading dock and sprained his ankle. I saw him two and a half years into his ordeal. He had had two surgeries, had countless hours of physical therapy, and no one knew what was wrong with him. And he came to see me, and I'm examining him, and he said, my, my foot is always cold. It, it, it's, I, it's driving me crazy. I, I hate this part. And I looked and I examined him, and sure enough, there was, he had no perineal strength and he had no range of motion um, in his ankle joint. And I said, well, I, I'll try this and see how this will work for you. So I did the fibula head first, and then I did the, the distal part where you, you drive the talus into the talocrural joint. And there was a loud, and I mean loud, audible pop that occurred. And I could feel his foot get warm in my hand which kind of gave me a sinking feeling in my stomach. I really didn't know what I had done. And, and, and he looked at me and said, oh, doc, that feels great. Thank you so much. And it was it. I mean, he was better after that and it went away and after two and a half years. So there's a lot to this. And I think that really what we're dealing with with chronic inhibition is a shutdown in the system that normally would excite and inhibit. And since it happens in other, in other entities, pathologies, then it makes sense that you can see it in simple things as well. Yeah. No, I know. I, 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 I see the effects of it clinically. I see the, yeah. the instant increase in strength. The, the problem is, is a plausible scientific explanation. Uh, well, it's not, it's, not an in, it's not an increase in strength. It's a change in signal. Uh, Sorry, an apparent uh, feeling yeah, of strength. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, the strength changes. There's no yeah. doubt about it. But I think it's, it's, it's neurologic. And I think a lot of what we treat yeah. is, is neuromechanical. Yeah. 
that missing that part of it is, is a big gap in, in, in training and learning. So how, how do you think the mobility of the fibula actually might affect that, the perineal or the, the, the strength testing of the perineals? Well, the perineal, the perineal as long as it originates in the fibula head. So there's probably some connection to that. And the other thing that happens is it's also the fibula head is the insertion point of the biceps femoris, which is a lateral hamstring that runs from the fibula head proximally. And it was always believed to insert into the ischial tuberosity. But a guy named uh, Andre Vleming from the Netherlands showed through micro, dissec micro uh, dissection that it actually, at its proximal end, the biceps inserts into the fibers of the sacrotubus ligament. Mm -hmm. And so you have a direct connection to the base of the spine from the fibula head. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the mechanism is really, that yeah. what are we doing when we free it, but it, it could be somewhere in that realm. The response, I've seen it so many times. It's not once or twice or not even 100 or 200, it's thousands. Yeah. And I've done it so often that, that I, I, I know it exists. I, I may not have a 100% explanation for it, but I still know it exists. Oh, I, I agree 100% it, it exists, but it's just the, you yeah. know, there's so much we've got to understand, so much we've got to do to um, look at better clinical indications for when we head down this pathway. Yeah. And also based on that, that assumption, there is so much not being managed properly because of it. Um, yeah. But it's proper documentation of it is really what's lacking now. And, and you know, if right. someone, I, wanted to, someone wanted to do a proper literature review and search on this topic, um, you're not going to find anything of any help. Of any help. And that, that's oh, really what, yeah. I'm, what, what does concern me. So wh how many people are missing out on, on this as a potential intervention because of that lack of adequate documentation and I, I think you're right if someone who's listening now wants to contact me um it's h dannenberg at gmail feel free and uh, oh. maybe we can collaborate you might have just made a big mistake then howard you might get <laughs> 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 nah, I, got, I got time craig and i got oh, you're tired yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um i uh, we had how many of the time craig we okay we had yeah, another 10, 10 minutes 10 minutes great we have one more question that came in uh beforehand <laughs> Uh, to me via email, which which um, is the, we may as well go through because we we don't seem to have any coming in on Facebook at the moment. And it was it was regarding a post they read on Podiatry Arena, and I think actually talking about it, Craig, it's, it was one of his posts many years ago now, where he talked about the possible reframing of hallux limitus, hallux rigidus as a continuum of of first metatarsophalangeal joint dorsiflexion stiffness and how functional hallux limitus may feed into that continuum as a sort of transient increase in dorsiflexion stiffness. Is that something that, that, that you feel comfortable with, uncomfortable with, or something you considered yourself? Well, I think that, um, I, I, yes, I mean, have I considered it? Of course. Um, but there are many, many functional hallux limitus that never become anything but functional hallux limitus. No arthritis develops at the MTP joint. Um, there's no joint changes that occur. The changes are elsewhere, either in the midfoot or in the, 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 the spine, for that matter. Um, so, and, and I don't quite understand why someone would go on to develop hallux limitus and someone would go on to develop um, a, a flexed lumbar sacral spine. I... I I, I don't know why would have one without the other. However, I've seen both. I mean, you could have, I, I ran into a friend I hadn't seen in probably 40 years. Um, and, well, we were in Florida over the winter and uh, he had retired from New York and moved down. I hadn't seen him in a long time. And he had terrible hallux limitus and, and a terrible back. I mean, he was just so hunched over and I, I hadn't seen him in a long time. So I just didn't tell it was and the hallux limitus was so bad there was nothing i was going to do about it so i just let it go and never even mentioned it but but these things can occur together um i i think that certainly over time the ability to avoid the mtp joint i, I mean now that i'm coming on my seventh decade in another i don't know i have i have another 10 or 11 months but um i i i you definitely, your joints lose flexibility. I mean, I work very hard. At, I practice yoga every day. I have to. Otherwise, I would be tight as a drum. And, and it, it becomes a very important part is maintaining flexibility um, in, in, in good health. I, I think that's really critical in understanding how... Uh, in, and and it, it stands to reason that the ancient cultures of the world that didn't have Advil and Motrin to take um, when they when they woke up in the morning and they were stiff, they developed techniques in mobility 
Tai Chi, yoga, mm -hmm. that, that maintain joint mobilities because they saw that and they understood that as being important. Yeah. No, thanks, Ed. I think what, what led me to sort of that, that concept sort of idea, and I, I know you and I have had this discussion before, is that previously people, they either had functional helix limitus or they didn't have functional helix limitus, whereas in reality, there's probably a continuum. And it's probably the people in the middle. We're not going to really know if they've got it or not, but it's not, it's not an either or. It's got to exist on some sort of continuum. Right. I'm sure it does. Yeah. I'm sure you're right. As, as, as does everything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a life cycle, um, you know. Actually, well, I've just, it's not a question. Bruce made, just, just made a comment or an observation talking about the size of your hands, Howard. Uh, Howard's gigantic <laughs> hand. Um, your hands, unlike somebody else's, make it much easier to do manipulation. <laughs> I, won't, no, I won't say oh, whose hands he was talking about. <laughs> well, was he, uh, Donald, so I shouldn't go to Donald Trump for manipulation. Huh? <laughs> uh, I didn't say it. <laughs> I know, I did. Fine. Um, so I... This, I would say that in this and probably other things, size does matter. Um, but there are, <laughs> there are techniques that you can do. I mean, I've taught uh, Michelle Giuliano, who I wrote, wrote many papers with over the years, uh, was not a very big woman. And, um, and she had small hands, but she became terrific at, at manipulation. It's just technique. Um, one of the, I, over the years, I've gotten to meet a lot of people around the world. Paul Keneally was one. Um, who taught me some extremely gentle techniques to be able to adjust cuboid, for instance, and make it absolutely painless um, and have outstanding outcomes with them rather than that cuboid whip technique. Um, those are available on YouTube. Anybody wants to look, just search my name and cuboid manipulation, you'll find them. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it helps. It makes it easier for me anyway. Yeah. Howard, someone's just sent me a private message saying to ask you if you were foot orthoses and if so do they have a uh, kinetic wedge or some form of first mtpg pj cutout who, who who's that i i someone's, I just, someone's messaged me asking if you wear orthoses with your own sort of prescriptions kinetic oh, wedges or mtpj cutouts oh absolutely and I, in fact i remember how much back pain i had it was very early on in the, in this process um, that I modified my own orthotics and my back pain pretty much went away, which got me very intrigued in, in trying to understand that process. I, I, I think we're pretty close to the end. I'm going to leave everybody with a very interesting thought that someone taught me a long time ago and makes really a lot of sense. When you say, oh, I've got it, you've automatically taken your mind and you've shut down looking for the other possibilities that might exist. But if you look at an idea, any idea for anything, and you say, oh, that's one way, you've taken your mind now and opened it to all the possibilities that really may exist into how you can implement that and what it means and the, um, and, and, and the future of what your idea could become. So I think that's a really important way to, 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 to use your own way of thinking to... Um, to, to open your mind up and, and expand your thinking to a way that helps people more than anything else. Okay. Thanks, Howard. That's a, a really good way to finish. I know we've had, we've had a lot of people join late. So for those of you who don't know, this video will be available for replay on Facebook in about 10, 15 minutes. Um, in a few hours time, we'll have it on YouTube. So please head over to YouTube and subscribe to our channel. And then after that, it'll be on our website. So please head over to our website and sign up for our email in which we can, um, notify you when new videos are ready so thanks so much for that howard it's been a, a good hour it's been good to get that background that we can't read about in textbooks and journal articles thanks um, howard yeah not a problem thanks guys i enjoyed it that was a lot of fun